We do not promote the use of legal or illegal psychoactive substances. This video has been created strictly for harm reduction purposes. In the United States, Canada, as well as several other countries, there is a selection of drug analogs which can be obtained legally through various chemical research laboratories. The sale of these substances operates in a very gray area of the law. They can be sold legally even though they are analogs of already illegal substances, but they can only be sold under the stipulation that they are not intended for human consumption. Let's not kid ourselves though. A lot of the people who are buying these substances obviously intend to consume them. And it's often due to these individuals' unsafe practice and just ignorance that a lot of these substances do become scheduled and made illegal in the long run. For example, in the beginning, all of the N-bomb substances were legal. They were unscheduled. It wasn't until greedy dealers started to sell 25i and BOME disguised as LSD that the substance was made illegal. It was made illegal because 25i NBOME has a very different safety profile than LSD. So if people were consuming an N-bomb substance thinking it's LSD, thinking it has the safety profile of LSD, when the safety profile of an NBOME substance is much steeper than the LSD safety profile, you're going to get deaths piling up and you're going to get a chain reaction that causes the substance that created those deaths to be scheduled. In fact, many popular substances began their run as legal RCs. They were available to buy legally online. Methalone, which was often sold disguised as Molly as an MDMA substitute, is a compound that acts very similar to MDMA, except it has a three times less affinity for the serotonin receptors. It started its run legally online. Other substances like 2CB were actually available legally in head shops. You could literally walk into a store in various parts of Europe and buy 2CB powder. It was sold under the name of Nexus. This guide is not intended to inadvertently raise awareness about the presence of research chemicals. I understand that after watching my video, some people will now become aware of them who weren't already. But the main goal of this video is to raise awareness around how to safely consume a research chemical. This video is intended to hopefully save the lives of people who are going to ingest these substances in an unsafe manner. Through pointing this out, I hope to avoid some of the criticism that I'm probably going to get by making a video about a class of compounds that a lot of the internet would love to remain secret. And let's be real for a second. Research chemicals have not been a secret for decades. My video is not going to change anything. The only thing that will result in a large amount of RCs being made illegal is if there's a lot of death tolls associated with any one drug. And what usually happens is there's a lot of deaths that pile up and then the media gets involved and it's due to that media intervention that causes them to be illegal. Not thanks to people like me releasing safety information about it. I wanted to point this out because every time I talk about certain research chems, there's a large group of people who get all up in arms and mad at me as if I'm like, releasing this huge holy grail of the secret of all these legal drugs. Well, newsflash guys, the DEA and all forms of law enforcement already know about research chemicals. They're not stupid, they have internet access. In fact, in Canada quite recently, I think it was within the past year, there was a case of an individual overdosing from, I believe it was a Tizalan, and someone else who lived in the house found a package after he had died being delivered to the house with the delivery of this substance, which they then presented the, to the police saying that this is the company that was supplying him with his, you know, illegal drugs, I believe. So the police investigated the research chemical company that was providing these legal RCs, and they did not find them at fault. You can actually still order online from this company, albeit now the ordering system requires, I think I read you need ID now, um, and they have become a lot more strict with who they will send substances to. But that all being said, even though someone overdosed from ingesting research chemicals, it wasn't enough to shut down the laboratory that was producing them because the police understand that they're operating within the law. All the term research chemical means is a compound that has little to no history of human use. In fact, nearly every psychedelic in circulation today began its life as an RC. Many of these popular research chemicals were actually invented by the famous Alexander Shulgin, who not only wrote about his experiences with these substances, but who also wrote for other chemists to learn how to create these compounds in his books, 
TCAL and PCAL. Not all research chemicals are dangerous, and a lot of research chemicals actually have quite a bit of anecdotal evidence to support their effects. The compound called 4-acetoxy-DMT is a research chem that greatly resembles psilocybin. Many people believe, including Alexander Shulgin himself, that 4-acetoxy-DMT, also known as psilocetin, is a prodrug for psilocin, which is the compound that psilocybin converts to in your body when you ingest it. A prodrug, meaning that 4-acetoxy-DMT, also converts into psilocin inside the body, giving you very similar, if not identical, effects to ingesting psilocybin mushrooms. Now, it's not unanimous. Not everybody agrees that the effects are identical from those two compounds. Some people do claim that they are slightly different. There are other research chemicals, such as the LSD analogs. For example, Ethlad, Allad, 1PLSD, ALD52, Prolad, Proethlad, and the list goes on. That's all I can remember off the top of my head right now. There's a lot of them, actually. These compounds are believed to have a very similar safety profile to LSD. Again, it's not proven because there's a lack of research in the field, but anecdotally, people believe they're just as safe as LSD. Point being, not all of these research chemicals are inherently dangerous. There are some which are safe. Sorry, I mean which might be safe, because realistically, more research is needed. First of all, I must warn everyone that being the guinea pig for ingesting a brand new psychoactive compound can potentially be dangerous. I do not recommend that anyone does this. However, regardless of my recommendations, people are going to do what people are going to do. There are always new compounds being released that have, well, quite literally, zero research behind them. If you intend to be a brand new explorer and try one of these uncharted compounds, you need to know how to do so safely. Regardless of the current data available on any given substance, the very first thing you're going to do is reagent test it. To do this, you're going to need something like the Marquis reagent or Ehrlich reagent or, you know, there's many other reagent tests and it all depends on what class of compounds you're testing. All of these can be obtained very cheaply online. We're talking $20 or less. I'm going to include a link in the video description for the test kit website that I personally use. If you are testing an RC that has a lot of history of human use, such as 4-acetoxy-DMT, you can then go online and do a Google search to see what type of color change you should be expecting. Allergy testing a new compound before ingesting it should not be strictly reserved for research chemicals. In fact, if one is practicing safe substance use, they will allergy test every substance, even pharmaceutical grade drugs, before ingesting it. I mean, it quite literally blows my mind that this is just not a common practice. In some cases, people have died due to their allergic reaction to pharmaceutical grade compounds. Which is why performing an allergy test before you consume any substance is absolutely vital if you really do care about your own well-being and safety. To allergy test a substance, you must first be aware of the active dose. Next, you are going to consume a fraction of that amount. For example, if the threshold dose was, say, 10 milligrams, meaning the dose required to feel any effects at all, what you would do is take one milligram and then you would wait an hour and see what would happen. To accurately weigh out doses this small, you need a very precise milligram scale or you simply need to dose volumetrically. After ingestion, you would wait to see if you were to have some type of allergic reaction, such as slight swelling of your throat, hives, itchiness, nausea and vomiting, Doses that small should not induce nausea and vomiting. Any type of allergic reaction that you're going to get from a dose this small again is going to be very slight and non-life-threatening, which is why you start off by allergy testing with such a small amount. Now, if you see absolutely no reaction, there's still a chance that you could be allergic to said substance, but you simply didn't see a reaction because it was too small an amount to cause an effect. Ideally, what you wanna do is keep allergy testing until you reach one-tenth of the active average dose, Remember, you are a guinea pig. I mean, a pioneer in the field of uncharted psychedelic territory. A lot of these substances have no documented data associated to them besides what you'll find in PCAL or TCAL. Or for those substances that were not invented by Alexander Shulgin, 
they sometimes have zero documented research. This means that you must follow the safest practice that you can and not rush to get a desired effect. The first dose of a new chemical after you've successfully allergy tested it should be no greater than half the active average dose, assuming there's data available about what the active dose is. So if the average active dose was say 30 milligrams, your first dose would be 10 to 15 milligrams. If it is a brand new chemical that you're ingesting that literally has no documented data available, you want to start extremely small. We're talking in the dose range of 10 to 20 micrograms small. You simply don't know if this compound is neurotoxic and dangerous. It might be a very long road until you finally reach levels where you see a psychoactive effect. I would highly suggest that anyone who intends to consume drugs that have no history of human use reads Dr. Shulgin's work. He talks about in his books how he himself highly minimized the risk of harm when ingesting all of his compounds, which when he ingested them were brand new. Being a psychedelic explorer is not about getting as fucked up as possible. It's about documenting your findings and sharing them with others. Even for your own safety, it's important that you document the effects of what dose you're taking. That way, when you go back to try a higher dose or a lower dose, you can see written down in detail what exactly occurred when you ingested the substance. For example, what you would write would look something like this. T plus zero, zero, zero consumed 15 milligrams of alilescaline. Next, you would write another log entry once you started to feel the effects. So for example, T plus 045, feeling the onset of some gastrointestinal distress, a bit of energy building, but no visual changes yet, and so forth until the experience came to an end. Then you would just sum up the experience and write some notes on, you know, how it went. Shulgin even had his own rating scale where he would document whether it was a plus experience, a plus plus experience, or a plus 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 experience. I'm not gonna get into what each one of those categories meant, but you can imagine that it was associated with the intensity of it. It is suggested to wait a bare minimum of three days between dosing, but ideally, you don't want to dose more than once every two to three weeks. So say again, the active dose was 30 milligrams and you were only taking 15, which would be a very light experience. You would still wanna wait at least two weeks before trying that substance again, because your brain does build a tolerance to these compounds and it needs approximately two weeks to reset that tolerance. You could technically try it again in a week, but your findings wouldn't be completely accurate because a week just isn't enough time to reset the tolerance. Of course, this is also dependent on what the compound is. However, if you're just performing an allergy test on a compound, you could even dose again the same day. Just keep in mind that you wanna wait an hour after your dose in order to document if any allergic reactions occur. There is a lot of data that I haven't covered in this video, simply because I didn't want the video to drag on for too long. I just wanted to cover the most important safety-oriented topics. Data such as the various routes of ingestion, practical ways to measure out your dosages, storage information, and more in-depth info on the Shulgin rating scale. For this reason, I have included a link in the video description to a very in-depth written guide that pretty much will tell you everything you need to know about how to research chemicals safely. To sum this video up and to talk a little bit about my personal experience with research chemicals, personally, I have no interest in documenting the effects of previously unknown compounds. This is just something that has too many inherent risks for me to really be interested in doing. There's already hundreds of substances available, albeit many of them are research chems, but a lot of the research chems such as the 2C series, like I mentioned the 4-acetoxy-DMT, many substituted tryptamines, all of these substances already exist and they have a lot of anecdotal evidence already, which kind of deters me from really being interested in testing brand new substances. There's already too much to research as it is that is more in the realm of safe than something completely unknown. Another one of the massive risks involved with ingesting, well, any RC, even some of the more documented ones, is the potential long-term damage. Since these compounds have virtually no data on their short-term usage, we definitely don't have any data on the potential long-term harms of them. I mean, is it really worth taking such a risk with your health? Even if you don't intend to use this guide for ingesting RCs, the information on how to allergy test something, and of course, reagent test a substance before taking it, is absolutely vital 
if you want to follow safe substance use guidelines. And if you follow these safe use practices, then it's very unlikely that you will ever encounter a negative reaction to a substance. Or, well, sorry, you might still get negative reactions. Sometimes taking half the active average dose will result in a negative reaction, but it's gonna be far less of a negative experience than had you consumed that full dose. If you follow what I'm saying, by following these safe use practices, you can find out ahead of time if a certain compound just isn't for you. Anyway, that concludes today's video. Thank you for watching, everyone. If you did enjoy this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up and if you haven't already, subscribe to our channel for weekly psychedelic related content. Thank you to everyone who's supporting us on Patreon. Your support means the world to me and I love each and every one of you. If you guys want to learn more about what Patreon is, you can visit the link and check it out there. Till next time, take care everyone, be safe, always test your substances, and yeah, don't do anything that I wouldn't do. Take care guys.